This episode of the Seniors Flourish podcast is brought to you by the Learning Lab membership because I get it. I was working with older adults in home health when I started out and I was the only OT practitioner. I was new, I had no mentorship, I struggled with the little things at work and I was so incredibly overwhelmed. I was struggling to keep up with that paperwork and because I was working such ridiculously long hours trying to research best practice, find all the patient handouts I needed, I just couldn't keep up with it all. And the worst part is I was constantly doubting myself. Am I really doing what's best for my new patients? That's why I created the Learning Lab because I desperately needed a way to get organized and have everything I needed at my fingertips. So it's cheaper than a textbook, but it has hundreds of treatment idea videos, patient handouts, evidence-based resources, and more right at your fingertips when you need it. So join today at seniorsflourish.com backslash learning lab. Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners disrupt the norm by throwing away the rainbow art and being the best you can be when working with older adults. Welcome everyone to the Seniors Flourish podcast. My name is Mandy Chamberlain and I'm an occupational therapist and I like to talk about everything occupational therapy and specifically working with the older adult. And today, um, my guest, Tamiko Faison, she's an occupational therapist and we are going to be talking about community-based practice for older adults with developmental disabilities. So I'm really interested personally in this topic. Um, I think it's an area that I have really limited experience in. And then when I do have a patient with developmental disabilities, I I feel a little lost and I don't really know exactly where to start. So I'm I'm really excited about your experience and your knowledge, Tamiko. And uh, so welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you, Mandy. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah. So today, I usually kind of just like to start and talk about your OT journey, how you got into occupational therapy, and what are you doing currently? Okay. (laughs) I actually had no idea what I really wanted to do when I um, went to college. I knew that I I, um, was going to go into healthcare because I was told that's where the job security was. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though I, I had an interest more in business, but um, I was told by someone who, in my family who was a successful nurse that I needed to go into healthcare for job security. And I didn't really know which direction I was going to go into. Um, strange thing happened. I had a, a kidney stone and went to the hospital at the um, university. And the person that x-rayed me was an x-ray student. So I ended up getting my bachelor's degree in radiologic science, which is x-ray. Oh, wow. Um, just because I had a good experience with a, that student. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was looking at, where am I going to get my master's degree? And I knew I wanted to get a master's degree. And I was leaning towards physical therapy. And someone invited me to hear a physical therapist speak. Mm-hmm. And when I went to the presentation, the occupational therapist spoke first and I was kind of upset because I was on a, a schedule and I was like, Oh no, I came here to hear physical therapy, not occupational, yeah. occupational yeah. therapy. And the occupational therapist spoke and I uh, just fell in love with the profession. I was like, Oh my goodness, this sounds like something that I would really be interested in doing because of the creativity um, mm-hmm. that it included. During that same time, I ended up taking a, a job working um, for a company called Anna's resources to learn about working more with people with uh, disabilities. And I want to tell a story about my, the first person I worked with, I'll call her Ella. And um, I was told that Ella had quite a reputation in a nursing facility. She was in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. She was in her 60s. She was a senior, but she had a um, developmental disability diagnosis as well as severe and persistent mental illness diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And she built up a, a reputation of just, what they would call uh, non-compliant uh, in the facility. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when I saw her, I remember she had long hair hanging down to her knees. It was mangled. She would barely speak to me. Um, I had just had a, a hard life and for that reason was pretty aggressive towards staff persons. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a lawsuit out called Thomas S, which allowed people who had dual diagnoses of mental illness and developmental disabilities to get a certain amount of money for, um, for deinstitutionalization. 
And she was a recipient of that. And I was able to work with her and see that transition. And it was absolutely amazing. She left the facility. She went into an apartment and we worked on um, occupation-centered work. Now, I was not an OT at the time, but I was learning about OT. And I was asking her, you know, what did you used to like to do and what things can you get involved in? And uh, she just transformed. She turned into a whole new person. Um, she loved going to church. And on Sundays, I would take her to a church and I'm African-American. I would take her to the, to the African-American church. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever been to a, like a traditional African-American church, but the preacher was preaching and sweating and I would roll her in in her wheelchair and she would say in a la- very loud voice, good morning, everybody. I have a song to sing for you. <laughs> oh my God. And and the preacher would stop and he would just let her sing and she would stand up and sing. And um, oh, wow. that was one of my greatest memories and really getting introduced to OT and then being able to work with her at the same time to see the power of occupation um, with persons with developmental disabilities. Wow. Um, I love that story. <laughs> I kind of have goosebumps because it, those it's always those patients that you feel like they've kind of been left behind that you kind of can connect with and you feel, you see the difference. Right. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. I, I saw the transformation. And then I, of course, you know, went straight through OT school. Um, uh uh-huh. Love the program that I was in at UNC Chapel Hill because it lent itself to really uh, creative and innovative practice um, and practice for two years before opening my business in 2003. Wow. Wow. That's so neat. That's so neat. So, okay. So you talked about your, a lot of your experience and your business is, well, let's just touch a little bit on your business and kind of what's the population that you work with. Um, It sounds like, and kind of things like that. Yeah, so the business is on Therapeutic Solutions, and uh, based on that story I just told you about working with who I call, will call Ella, that's not a real Mm -hmm. name, um, but Mm -hmm. Ella for confidentiality purposes, I was really interested in working with adults with developmental disabilities because I Mm -hmm. saw um, more kids getting services, and then at a certain age, all of a sudden, the services stopped. Yeah, Um, yeah. And so I had that interest, and in school, I was able to work on a retirement program as a community-based project assignment, a retirement program for adults with developmental disabilities. So there's these folks in these uh, vocational workshops and they're working and there's no really transition plan for them to retire, which is what I had saw with Ella, um, where they Mm. just kind of stuck her in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And so I created a retirement transitional program and I was able to implement it in field work at a vocational workshop. So after I graduated, that's where I wanted to um, focus my business on. Um, of course, as soon as I graduated, I was, even though I wanted to start a business, everybody said, you can't start a business unless you have five years of experience. This imaginary rule that I kind of, yes, I know. I I said, well, I guess I have to do what the the imaginary rule says I have to do. So I went to, you know, I took a regular job, but, uh, two years out, I had my son, uh, he was three months preemie and I just decided I'm going to start the business and I'm going to sink or swim. And I focused on adults with uh, developmental disabilities. I began contracting myself out to group homes, started out with six group homes, and it grew pretty rapidly to um, being a consultant for 24 group homes that served uh, a lot of adults with developmental disabilities. Um, Later, I had to add contractors under me because I couldn't do all the work and I, I knew um, part of the reason that I started the business is because I was also a mom and I wanted to have that balance and flexibility. Yeah. yeah. And add the contractors. And then we added um, therapists going into rural areas where they were really having a hard time recruiting occupational therapists in uh, state psychiatric facilities, as well as state facilities that serve people who had um, developmental disabilities. Wow. Then, yeah. Then in 2007, I had no uh, desire to add another service, but I was working with someone in a psych facility who I noticed was misdiagnosed with psychosis and she really had low vision. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, she mixed up her meds um, because she couldn't see the writing on on the pill bottle. So we added yeah. the low vision services. So now, right now we have low vision services. We serve people with developmental disabilities and then we serve people who have uh, severe and persistent mental illness. Our goal is really to work in those niche 
areas that OTs mm-hmm. traditionally aren't going into and where these people otherwise would not have services if we were not um, stepping out and providing it for them. Oh my gosh, that's an amazing, that's amazing because it's one of those things like you as like, obviously you go to OT school and you learn about all these different, you know, areas, niches and things like that. But then you kind of feel like you get in kind of the quote real world and then you don't really get to fully serve those niches. Right. So it's, it's really, that's a really neat business model that you are providing those uh, services for those area for those types of uh, areas that really, really need it. Gosh. So I bet, I bet, I mean, especially in where you are, I mean, there's all sorts of, I mean, you have a lot of, is it mostly like word of mouth for referrals or is it just like being able just marketing and getting out there and saying, this is what we can provide that is not being provided to your clients or? Yes, it's a lot of marketing, um, a lot of education. And I think you asked me earlier, um, what, what am I actually doing in the business right now? I actually, Mm -hmm. um, don't do a lot of clinical work. I do a lot of administrative work right now. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The E-Myth, but I think it's a mm-hmm. great book for entrepreneurs yes. to read because it talks about how uh, an effective business runs with three different types of people. So you have your clinician, which is like your, you know, your occupational therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have your manager who manages the day-to-day activities. And then you have your entrepreneur who's the visionary, who's planning and going out to create new types of business. Um, I actually have just stepped into the role truly as, as an entrepreneur. <laughs> so mm, yeah. in the I was the clinician, I was the manager, I was the entrepreneur. And then later I stepped back and I became um, the manager and I had more clinicians um, going out into the community, excellent therapists who um, just by nature of them being great therapists um, marketed for the, for the mm, business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was a terrible manager. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. You got to find your role. You got to find your role, you know? <laughs> yes. I was trying to manage the day to day and I, um, I'm not gifted in details and I yeah. had to find someone who could come in and really, um, help in that area and also brought on a mentor. Um, and am now really focusing on, um, being a, a true entrepreneur while having a manager in place as well as great independent contractors. Um, wow. but again, and, and lots and lots of marketing for myself, um, as an yeah. entrepreneur, uh, workshops, networking, um, helping people to understand what OT is because some yeah. people have no clue, especially when we talk about the non-traditional <sighs> settings, like why would an OT yes. work with an adult with a developmental disability or why would an OT work with someone with a vision impairment. We don't understand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I feel like people don't even really know in traditional roles, let alone in those <laughs> <Right>. non-traditional <laughs> roles. I know. And I always think it's interesting. So, I mean, what is the umbrella term or like, how would you define developmental disabilities just in, you know, in general, general, in general, yeah. um, a developmental disability typically starts at birth um, or during childhood. Um, the the disability continues um like indefinitely right you know it doesn't necessarily wax and wane um and then it impacts your function so it those are the three criteria that i believe are in the the dsm but it's going to significantly impact the person's ability to function um and it's typically caught when they're younger right You know, I always think it's kind of interesting because, you know, because I do live in like a mountainous kind of rural area. And so, you know, you just kind of see, I think about the patients that I've seen that have developmental disabilities that maybe are, you know, older, older adult, maybe an example is um, I can think of, I can think of a few, but one in particular um, was uh, someone that lived with, you know, their family members in the community, but then their, their parents or his parents got old, old, older and couldn't take care of him. And he was at the time, I think, um, in his mid six, early mid sixties, if I remember, then he was transitioned to, uh, um, they didn't have like a lot of group homes and then, or I'm kind of trying to remember what would happen. No, he was hospitalized and then he ended up going into a nursing home. Mm-hmm. And the idea was to go back to the group home because that, well, that wasn't going back, but going to a group home because he had been living with his parents, 
And it was like this whole thing because it was like adjusting to this new environment and he'd been really truly cared for under more of a medical model because he wasn't in a group home. He was in his, with his parents and there was a lot of things he actually never really learned to do mm-hmm. because of more of a medical model versus more of like a supportive model. Right. Um, and so I think just that the difference between like being in like a skilled nursing facility versus a group home versus community, like a community based service and the different models that they, um, end up being cared under, I think is challenging because, you know, he went, came into like skilled nursing, but then as an OT, you know, I just, I had a really hard time. I didn't actually really feel like I knew where to start, like what were appropriate evaluations. Cause this gentleman had um, down syndrome. And so then, um, with down syndrome, then he had, you know, some dementia and then, you know what I mean? And then like for someone who had limited experience, I was like, okay, um, is this, you know, the develop, is this the down syndrome? you know, is this the dementia? And then it was like, I didn't really know where to start. (laughs) It was like this whole kind of thing about like evaluations or any kind of objective measures and that kind of thing. And I remember just feeling like, I, I'm feel, I am out of my comfort zone and I'm like doing the research, trying to figure out and that type of thing. And I know you guys do more community based, but what kinds of like evaluations or objective measures do you typically compare? you know, complete or areas of occupation that you kind of are most commonly impacted that someone that it has limited experience like me, that (laughs) might be a good place to start. Okay. Um, we typically do a lot of observation and, Mm -hmm. um, we talk a lot to the person as well as to our caregivers that are involved. As you know, a Mm -hmm. lot of the standardized assessments don't, um, are not made for adults with developmental disabilities. Yeah. Um, I did use a standard assessment, um, the sensory profile for adults with developmental disabilities. Um, mm-hmm. I believe I got that off of Tina Champagne's website. Um, I love Tina yeah, OT, yes, she's, she's OT Intervention. Or, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, OT yes. Intervention. Yes. yes. Um, and then also um, modified versions of the COPM, the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know if you've used that before, but way you are asking the person what they are having difficulty doing um, mm-hmm. in their occupational performance areas and rating those areas, prioritizing them and looking at the satisfaction and how that changes um, bef- from the beginning of the service to the discharge. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's individualized because some folks with developmental disabilities can easily um do a, you know, do a rating like that, like the COPM and then others cannot. I think um, one of the issues is that some people assume that because a person has a developmental disability, that it is cognitive. And that's not something mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the definition, but the um, disability or the impairment can be cognitive. It can be physical. It can be mm-hmm. behavioral. Um, so just because the person has this, uh, for example, like CP, a lot of times people assume because a person has CP, you see the physical uh, disability, they assume that right. cognitively they also have an impairment and that's not necessarily the case. And we, my husband actually is a counselor and he used to work um, with someone who had CP at a facility. And I clearly remember him calling my husband constantly saying, you know, these people think I'm stupid, um, you know, because he's, he spoke, yeah. um, it was his speech was sometimes hard to understand and he had the physical deformity, but incredibly bright, but everyone at the facility um, did not think he was bright. So there was a lot of advocacy taking place um, um, for him. So where to start, you know, just looking at the person as an individual and finding out as much as you can about their history. Like you said, you were trying to figure out what was the dementia and what was the down syndrome. So um, looking at their history and getting a baseline, what has been typical Um, Mm -hmm. for this person um, before you started providing the service Um, and then just having them involved as much as possible. You'd be surprised at um, how much they can articulate the things that are more difficult for them to do um, due to the change in in their level of of function. Mm -hmm. Um, We did a lot of environmental design. I've worked a lot with adults with um, developmental disabilities in the vocational workshops. And we did like jigs and a lot of task analysis and uh, creating things in the environment that made it easier for them to 
to perform the task. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, that makes complete sense. Yeah, the work thing. Gosh, I bet that was. Do they still do that? You said you helped kind of work on that. Do they still have that in that community? Where they There's have like a lots program? of vocational workshops for adults with d developmental disabilities. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. OTs are not. <laughs> you know, they're not there. And I don't know why right. OTs are not in the vocational workshops. Um, they need to be there because they know how to adapt the environment. Um, I remember mm -hmm. one person I worked with, he couldn't collate and we just made a jig. We call it a jig. I don't know what the, the real name for it is. <laughs> the real, I don't either, but I know what you're talking about. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we created this jig where we had layers for the different pages that he had to collate. We put it, we made a dowel, we put a little um, piece of plastic on the dowel and he was able to use one hand to take the dowel and push the paper off the layers so that he could collate it in the correct order. Um, before that, they were saying he can't collate at all. You know, he has to do another job because he can't do it all, even though that's what he said he wanted to do. Um, but the vocational workshops, if you, you know, in any state, if you go to the to your state's um, mental health, uh, DD and substance abuse um, uh, division or DHHS, Department of Health and Human Service, and look up vocational rehab, you'll see that it's, it's pretty vast across the nation. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, OTs aren't part of that group for the most part. Um, Interesting. But very yeah, valuable. Just kind of a, yeah, yeah. You kind of just, I mean, obviously I don't work in that area, so I don't really know. But like you just kind of feel like it's such a natural, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's some somewhere, but like it's not a common theme. So what are some of those barriers that people with developmental disabilities have to really have that you know, inclusion in our in our communities? Um, well, one of them is work, what we just talked about. Um, vocational mm -hmm. workshops are great for some folks, but not for everybody um, that has a developmental disability. And all too often, I think the persons with developmental disabilities go to work at a vocational workshop. Right, <laughs> and right, right. Vocational right. workshop, they're just put in jobs that um, are not necessarily based on their strengths. Um, mm. I've seen people um, in vocational workshops with tasks in front of them and they just sit there and look at them for hours, um, right. you know, and the, the task has not been adapted or folks who want to do, you know, they don't want to work in a workshop. They want a, um, they don't even necessarily want a blue collar job. They might want to, you know, they have aspirations yeah. to do something else and right. it's not even been um, thought about for them. Um, I think there is more of a move, at least in North Carolina, where they're saying, Hey, um, let's look out and see what else can these people do besides, um, you know, collate or doing, you know, repetitive jobs. And I, I think mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong for someone who wants to do that for, but for people who want to do more, that has been a, a, a big barrier. Um, another barrier I found, um, is, you know, just that people, um, focus heavily on the physical part of the disability more so than, um, what could be going on cognitively, mm. um, and psychosocially. In, for example, one group home chain that we've, um, we don't consult with them anymore, but I do remember whenever we would get a referral for someone who needed a spoon, you know, like an adaptive spoon, a built up handle, a uh, shower chair, uh, they were all about us coming and providing as much consult as needed. But if someone wanted to work or they were having issues like social skill issues, <laughs> then they yeah. would say, you know, it's not necessary and we don't really need to pay an OT to come in and help this person write, you know, they want to write their friend a letter. That's not mm. necessary, but if they need a spoon, you know, we need to make sure they get that piece of adaptive equipment. I think it's just like, it's more tangible and they just yes. felt that um, they could justify it more. Um, yeah. But that's a barrier, helping them to understand the whole person and not just uh, compartmentalize based on uh, the physical needs. Right. Yeah, you can tell. I mean, you even see that in different settings. Oh, I mean, yes. I don't know. Yeah, I don't even know how, like, you know, how it how it's set up, like for group homes. But you work in other areas, like I don't know, skilled nursing. But it's like the areas that they focus on. You're like, there's a lot that goes into us. Get you know, it's not just giving them a spoon. Like, right. like you were talking about the person that had that was took the wrong medications. Her problem actually wasn't what they thought her problem really was. It's right. like. <laughs> even right. see it, but it's, that's, I mean, obviously I'm a huge OT proponent, so I think we're kind of awesome. And I like <laughs> to see that we're just, we just look at patients, 
you know, more holistically. And those right. are the, you know, those are the things. Um, how about, have you seen, I mean, cause I do know that, you know, dementia, um, is more prevalent or earlier or ra- more rapid onset for certain developmental disabilities. Do you, do you see that in like community settings as th- that being any kind of issue or barrier or is that not as prevalent? Yeah. So down syndrome and dementia is very common to have that dual diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And um, typically the onset is earlier. I think like fifties, late fifties, mm-hmm. you see it more. So when I was uh, doing the clinical work, I did see it more. Um, and the therapists, of course, that are contracting now, they do see it as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I remember the first person I worked with who sounds similar to the person you mentioned who had down syndrome and dementia and you were trying mm-hmm. to figure out, okay, which is, which yeah. is the dementia and which is the, um, down syndrome. And there was a yeah. lot of sensory issues. And I, um, I, I, wholeheartedly believe in using mentors <laughs> um, oh, yeah, and yeah, experts. Yeah. And I reached out to Tipa Snow, um, who is a, a wonderful, great, um, yeah, she is awesome. She is so awesome. Oh my gosh. Um, she's an expert in, um, working with people with dementia and she mentored me with that particular person, um, in terms of some interventions. I believe one of them was looking at ways for, the person to have sensory stem in her um, private areas because there mm-hmm. was some um, behaviors that the group home, of course, was saying, this is all behavioral and it's not socially acceptable. Right. And she's like, well, she's losing sensory sensation in this area. So let's look mm-hmm. at um, ways where there can be some sensory stem there that would be considered socially uh, appropriate. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, yes, there is a, there is that correlation. Um, and then there's a, a, group home, I think it's at the time it was when they built it years ago, I believe they were saying it was the first in the nation that was strictly for older adults with developmental disabilities. It was like a nursing, not a nursing home, but like a a group home, but it was just for seniors, just for seniors with developmental disabilities. And it was the neatest, the neatest place. So the people there were trained in being able to work with people who have, who are seniors or aging who may have, you know, um, dementia or or Alzheimer's and as mm-hmm. well as having a uh, developmental disability. And it was so occupation centered. Like they had this huge kitchen where they all could go in and cook and it wasn't just doing four, you know, they had a garden um, or they have, cause I believe it's still, still in existence. The uh, company was mm-hmm. RSI residential services incorporated that created that um, wow. group home there. And there needs to be more of those because like you said, yeah. they end up going into a nursing home and the people in the nursing home were saying, Hey, I'm not really trained to work with people with developmental disabilities, but if they stay in the group home, the folks in the group home were saying, Hey, I'm not really trained to work with people with dementia or, you know, yes. people who are aging. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's what kind of happens. And it's kind of like the, it's like, I feel like they get kind of a little bit lost in the shuffle because some a facility, like you were mentioning, it's like they have the experience of both right. and that, and then you can help them, you know, you know, it's all about quality of life and, you know, being, you know, client centered. And it's just such a different experience when you have those people that are trained in that or have a good understanding of it versus looking at some of those things as like, like you were saying earlier, behavioral, like, oh, that's just behavioral. Well, you know, it's not always the case. Right. That's very true. <laughs> always know, as we always know, I know. So, okay. So we were talking about those are the, those are the things I think are kind of, I mean, looking at the resources. So you were talking about like reaching out to members and kind of just like piggy bank, piggy backing on what you were talking about, Tipa Snow. So if anybody is interested in learning more about um, dementia, like you, you were saying, you know, Tipa Snow, she has a lot of like YouTube videos and she has a website and she sends out newsletters and she's really big on positive. Oh, no, I'm trying, no, I'm going to forget positive a positive approach to working with people who have dementia. So check, check, definitely check her out. So what, is there any other kind of resources that you think if somebody's kind of looking to work with adults with developmental disabilities, um, what kind of resources that they can further themselves in, you know, feel more educated about the topic or um, other people that you feel would be good mentors and things like that? Um, Tina Champagne, um, but then also stepping stepping outside of OT because sometimes yeah. we get in our our bubbles 
you know. Um, what? <laughs> yeah, we get our, our bubbles. Yeah. And I think OT, of course, is awesome. But I think that we, you know, if we're going to work with these different populations and we break out into these non-traditional settings, we also need to be involved in other organizations. So um, your local ARC, um, the uh, professional organizations that focus on working with people with with developmental um, disabilities in your state. Like we have what mm-hmm. we call the ARC of um, North Carolina He's, that serves people with developmental disabilities. They have conferences, um, they have workshops, they have uh, experts that you can network with and connect with and learn from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, yeah. Use your resources, man. Exactly. <laughs> like, it's like digging around. It's nice to have, you know, those um, organizations, especially like you said, in your state or locally that have that specifically. So you've been working with people that have developmental disabilities. Obviously you're more on the entrepreneur side now, but you've been working with them for many years now. So what are some things that you love about working with this population? Um. Or why do you feel like you were drawn? Is it just from that one experience? I, I've always just, I feel that I've been just, I try to be led spiritually um, mm-hmm. where I feel that God would have me to be at certain times in my life. And there there was definitely a, a spiritual connection when I worked with, with her, but also other people. Like she's, she mm-hmm. was just one of the persons that I worked with over at Anna's Resources. I had another um man that I work with who stands out, who had uh, autism and he, um, ended up getting an apartment. He was a young man, um, but moved from his mom's home and got an apartment. He shared it with a physical therapy student. And I think it was just rewarding to see someone who, um, people think can't do Mm, to see mm -hmm. them become successful. That is very rewarding to me personally and spiritually. Um, He was able to get a job. He opened up a bank account. Um, I lived a very full life um, up until I left the Mm. the company. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think like not just people with developmental disabilities, but any person with a disability, I Mm -hmm. think there's. I mean, there's just too many stereotypes, too much stigma in place about what they can and cannot do. And to me, it's very rewarding to see uh, people maximize their their potential. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What do you think are some of the challenges? I mean, we all, every population, everybody that we're working has the challenges. What's the po- what's what are the challenges? Maybe not even of just working with um, this population, but just the line of work of OT working with people with developmental disabilities? Um, I would say uh, back to the, what we I talked about earlier about the education that people don't know <laughs> um, mm, yeah, what yeah. we're doing in this particular setting. Um, I think another challenge is uh, reimbursement. And I was just going to actually ask about that. Like, how does that work? Yeah, um, reimbursement is, is definitely a barrier um, so for with group homes, typically, at least in North Carolina, um, they get a bed rate for each person that comes into to stay in the group home. So that's like a flat rate for this one person. And then out of that bed rate, they are to provide everything that that person needs. So mm-hmm. if that person needs OT, then it's going to come out of the bed rate. Uh, so okay. what does it make sense for a person who's only thinking about finances and business to do? to have them <laughs> right. used OT as least as possible, you know. Yeah, minimum. <gasps> like, yep, yeah. yep. So they, yep. They, they pay, you know, you negotiate a rate with the, the group home um, and they pay you that flat fee. But of course, um, in their mindset too, a lot of folks that say that they can do life skill training um, are not necessarily OTs and, mm-hmm. and they don't make as much as OTs. So that is a challenge where you have someone saying, well, I can, teach life skills and I, you can pay me $15 an hour, you know, right. I'm going to pay an OT 50 plus an hour. Um, and then you're doing the same thing and we know it's not the same thing, but at times, um, that's the way it is described. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah, those it's I think of yeah, it's like the money. It's like trying to provide the service, but then it's always like minimal. Like <laughs> it's little to get the job done. All right. Yeah. The bar- the barriers of that, you know. Yes. And so uh, and the other part is that OTs can bill insurance for working with people with developmental disabilities, adults. Um, and then we just, a lot of OTs just don't know how to do it or they're afraid of it, which I was when I first started billing it. And it's still not my favorite part of the job, but it definitely <laughs> yeah. um, affords an opportunity to serve um, more people. If you can dig in and, and, and research and understand um, what the regulations and the contractual agreements say about um what the person is allowed to to have and occupational therapy mm. is listed. So for a lot of folks with developmental disabilities, adults, um, adults with severe and persistent mental illness, they can, they can have occupational therapy and their insurance um, mm-hmm. can pay for it many times. Um, yeah. but, but not understanding that part of the business model is definitely a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels like that stuff is always ever changing. And maybe it's not because I'm not really in it, but I'm always like, oh my gosh, I feel like I just like, I'm, as someone who doesn't even personally bill, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like I just, I, I, I do independent contracting, but I don't do my own like billing okay. per se. Okay. Um, so like um, I, someone who doesn't even bill, I'm always like, gosh, it feels like the rules are always changing and trying to figure it out, let alone being in charge of that. So and they are, and you're, like, you're, you're 100% right. It's like you learn it, and you dig in and you're like, okay, I got it. And then as soon as you get it, you get an email that says it's effective tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Everything changes. You're like, great. Yeah. Here we yeah. go. So Here we go again. Something. Back to the drive. For sure. <laughs> well, you had talked about a little bit earlier about your, you know, obviously about your company, Therapeutic Solutions. But do you also do consulting? Do you do consulting for um, other businesses that are interested in? Or is it mostly for like um, like other group homes and kind of? the awareness of OT and how your um, business can provide those services? I do consulting and coaching for other uh, health and human service professionals. So that includes occupational therapists. Um, I am on a mission. I feel like this is a God-given mission to help at least a million um, health and human service professionals start and grow service-oriented um, businesses that are fun and profitable and, and for yeah. folks that are have high ethical standards. And mm-hmm. I, I've just met too many people in my small circle who are uh, working for companies that are, um, that don't have the best ethical standards and they're working mm-hmm. with people who I think deserve high quality service. And so for folks that have the heart that want to put quality over quantity, you know, I understand there has to be a balance. I'm learning, definitely learning, yep. you know, you, you need to make a profit for sure, but not right. to compromise your quality because of quantity. And mm. OT is lucrative. It can be extremely yep. lucrative in certain settings. And for that mm-hmm. reason, um, some, you know, sometimes people get greedy <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, you're, you're, People are in settings where sometimes they're asked to have an unrealistic uh, productivity um, or to say that they're doing things that they don't, didn't necessarily do in order to meet, I think, what they call rug levels and certain quotas and things yeah. like that. Um, and that's what I don't want to see. I want to see that change. And I feel that occupational therapists, as well as other health and human service professionals who have gone into their profession to really serve people, um, given the right. Uh, tools and encouragement um, can be great business owners. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I do the, I do the coaching because sometimes I'll tell people, you know, this is how I did it. This is how I did group home consulting and, Mm -hmm. or this is how I um, was able to bill for working with a person with severe and persistent mental illness. And then they, they never do it. (laughs) Right. Right. So there's the coaching (sighs) part of it where you're really helping to, um, have this person understand what is it that you really want to do and why do you want to do it? And then there's also just that what my probably my favorite part is, is just the encouragement and the inspirational part and helping a person to know that you can do this. (laughs) You know, Mm. it is possible. I don't care what um, everybody else around you is saying. Um, I don't care if it's never been done before. 
it's still possible mm-hmm. that, that you can do this. Just like people told me, you can't start the business you know, mm-hmm. out of school. You can't start a business when you, right after you graduate, you have to wait five mm-hmm. years. And then two years later, when I said, I'm going to start it, I had so many people say, you can't do that because you just had a baby and your baby's premature and you need yeah. benefits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are you going to do about your benefits? And what are you going to do about your job security? You, you're out of your mind. And you know, you know what I always think about, because the people that worked at this particular facility I was working at, they don't work there anymore because that facility shut down. And this was Mm. a state, a large state psych facility. And so it just reminds me that we make false security. We come up with false security. So in my work, you know, my business is still going and they're not working at that job that they told me I needed to stay at because that's where the security was. Oh my gosh, you're you're talking to uh, we're soul sisters. No, really? I be, I believe. That, I, I, oh my gosh, I, that's a whole another podcast <laughs> topic. But um, my husband and I are both self employed, and you know we got to you know I we got to the point where this is just for us. But um, you know I it is a, I also feel personally that it is a false sense of security. I mean I do believe if you like to feel it like it or not, I think we're all replaceable for these companies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I, and I get that. Um, but I mean, you could lose your job tomorrow. Things could change. Something could happen. A business, it could be a business or like Medicare changes or insurance or whatever, or they need to make cuts. That's not necessarily security. So there's a level of your own drive, but anyway, Oh, I, I digress here. <laughs> like, but no, I know I love, I love, well, I love talking to other entrepreneurs, but I do love the, um, cause you can do it. You can do it. Something starting a podcast and a website, even like it's, mine's very non-traditional OT, but I, I'm just like, I can do it. And you just do it and you, I'm doing it. You're doing it. You're doing <laughs> it. You're doing a great job at it. I'm really oh, enjoying nice. this. But did okay. So, if anybody had any questions or would love to contact you, is there a best way to do that? Sure, they can send me an email. Um, it's my first name, T O M E I C O Tomiko at T S, which stands for Therapeutic Solutions O F of, and then N C North Carolina dot com. Tomiko at T S of N C dot com. Um, okay. They can also check out. Um, the Face and Consulting website, www.faceandconsulting.com. Um, and that's where I talk about the coaching and consulting services. Um, they really do focus on those niche areas, the innovative and non traditional um, practice areas. Okay. I'll add all of Tamiko's um, information and you know ways to connect with her on the show notes. And I'm going to be adding a bunch of things like. Tina Champagne's website, like, you know, some of the um, just like assessments and things used and just kind of give some good information using it as a resource. Check it out because it's such an amazing area to serve as an occupational therapist and working with the population of people with developmental disabilities. So Tamiko, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. And until next time. Do you feel like you're navigating the OT world without a map? Not feeling confident or competent in your day-to-day treatments and struggling to apply your knowledge clinically? Then be sure to check out the Seniors Flourish Learning Lab membership. It has all the treatment ideas, patient handouts, clinical resources, community support, and mentorship you need to succeed. Join today at seniorsflourish.com slash learning lab.